Coming up on this Tuesday edition of Daybreak, following President Park's parliamentary address, the ruling party offers to accept one of the opposition party's demands related to the recent election scandal. The opposition says both conditions must be met before getting back to parliamentary business. The operator of Japan's crippled Fukushima nuclear plant has started the delicate and time-consuming process of removing spent fuel rods from mangled reactor number four. The decommissioning of all four reactors at the plant will take up to 40 years. Plus, a citywide manhunt is underway in Paris after a gunman attacks a media building and fired outside a bank, badly injuring one person. Police suspect the gunman also broke into another media office last Friday. Daybreak begins now. You're watching Daybreak on Tuesday, November 19th. I'm Chi Yuzan in Seoul. We begin this morning at the National Assembly where President Park Geun-hye delivered her first policy speech to Parliament. Addressing a packed house on Monday, the President outlined her government's key policy goals and called on rival parties to settle their differences that have brought parliamentary activity to a grinding halt. Our uh, presidential correspondent Oh jin -ju has our top story. President Park once again called on the ruling and opposition parties to stop their political confrontation and disputes over allegations the nation's spy agency meddled in last year's presidential election. 정부는 국민적 의혹이 제기된 사안들에 대해 빠른 시일 내에 국민 앞에 진상을 명확하게 밝히고 사법부의 판단이 나오는 대로 책임을 물을 일이 있다면 반드시 응분의 조치를 취할 것입니다. In her policy address to Parliament on Monday, the president pledged to tighten discipline among government agencies so no such allegations are raised in future elections. Emphasizing that the parliament is at the center of politics, President Beck said the government and the assembly should now work towards what she called a productive and cooperative relationship. On next year's budget plan, President Peck said it focuses on economic revitalization and job creation. In particular, she called on lawmakers to quickly pass bills aimed at achieving these goals, for example, those on promoting foreign investment and tourism, normalizing the housing market, and supporting small and medium businesses for a creative economy. Analysts say her somewhat conciliatory tone was aimed at bringing about a breakthrough in the current political impasse and ensuring passage of the government's budget for 2014, as well as various bills that are crucial to people's livelihoods. Oh jin Ju, Adrang News. And staying with that story, following the president's speech, the ruling party offered the opposition a deal to get back to parliamentary business. Our political correspondent Kim Hyun-ji has the details. The ruling Senate Party gave President Park's speech positive reviews and said it could serve as a turning point to put an end to the current political impasse. Through her speech today, President Park has given sufficient answers to the demands the opposition bloc has consistently made. It's now time for the National Assembly to respond. It's time for us to end the political strife and make bipartisan efforts. It's time to stop putting a strain on governance and opposing the government for the sake of opposition. But the main opposition Democratic Party said the president's speech did no more than shift the blame for the current political gridlock. The president said many things, but there were no correct answers. She has shown her shallow understanding of the seriousness of the current state of affairs. President Park is the one who caused chaos in the state of affairs because state agencies, including National Intelligence Service and the Justice Ministry, have committed unlawful acts since she took office. But she has not even expressed regret. 
Meanwhile, in a surprise move, the ruling Tenori Party announced late Monday that it will accept the opposition's demand for creating a special parliamentary committee tasked with reforming this spy agency. While rejecting the call for a special probe into allegations that state agencies, including the intelligence agency and military, meddled in last year's presidential election to influence the outcome in favor of the conservative ruling party. Creating a special committee for reforming the spy agency and launching a special probe for allegations of illegal electioneering by state agencies has been the Democratic Party's two pronged proposal. The ruling Senate Party had consistently rejected the demands, but offered on Monday to accept one of the two, on the condition of normalizing parliamentary business. But the Democratic Party says the ruling party must accept its proposal in its entirety. If the rival parties reach a compromise, parliamentary proceedings for the remainder of this session will be normalized. If not, the gridlock at the parliament is likely to continue. Kim hyun Arirang News. The top foreign policymakers of South Korea and China sat down in Seoul on Monday for talks that reportedly focused on North Korea's nuclear program and rising nationalism in Japan. Our Hwang Sung-hee has the details. Monday's high-level security talks in Seoul between South Korea's Presidential National Security Office Chief Kim Jang-su and Chinese State Councilor Yang Jie-chi signals the first step toward establishing closer bilateral ties. The meeting, the first of its kind, was one of the agreements reached between South Korean President Park Geun-hye and her Chinese counterpart Xi Jinping in June, as they saw the need for a new high-level security dialogue channel. Ahead of the meeting, Yang met with President Park, who said his visit will be a good chance for the two countries to strengthen trust. During the closed-door discussion between Kim and Yang, the two foreign policymakers were expected to focus on North Korea's nuclear program as a priority. Beijing has been actively seeking an early resumption of the stalled six-party denuclearization talks involving the two Koreas, the United States, China, Japan and Russia. For now, the six members agree on the need to lay out specific conditions for dialogue, but Seoul, Washington and Tokyo say the time is not right for talks. Beijing may try to persuade Seoul to change its stance, but experts say any efforts will likely fall short of bringing the six parties back to the negotiating table before the end of the year. Another issue that may have been discussed is Japan's pursuit of nationalistic agendas, such as the right to collective self-defense. While the move has gained support from Western countries, Seoul and Beijing have been against it, as they were victims of Japan's past militarism. Japan ruled Korea as a colony in the early 1900s, and China also suffered under Japanese invasion. And amid the recent flurry of diplomacy between Seoul, Beijing and Washington, experts point to the possibility of the strategic talks developing into a three-way meeting once it settles as a stable and regular diplomacy channel. Hwang sang Arirang News. Fifteen years ago, the two Koreas fueled hopes of inter-Korean reconciliation by establishing the Mount Kungang Tourism Program. But the ambitious project um, uh, came to, was suspended in 2008 after a South Korean tourist was shot and killed by a North Korean soldier. Our Han Da-eun tells us why it doesn't appear the trips will be up and running again anytime soon. The Kumgang tour will be suspended until we get to the bottom of this incident. While the two Koreas are still assigning blame for the shooting death of a South Korean tourist by a North Korean soldier in 2008, some 20 officials from Hyundai Asan Corporation, which led the joint tourism project, visited Mount Kumgang on Monday for a small event celebrating the 15th anniversary of launching the project. It's an historic day for Hyundai officials, but not quite so for the governments of South and North Korea. The two sides remain at odds as they face two delicate problems to solve before they can even begin discussing the resumption of tours. First is the issue of guaranteeing the safety of tourists. Seoul has long pinpointed a guarantee of personal safety as the primary precondition to resume the tourism project, but Pyongyang has yet to show any efforts regarding the matter. 
The North also hasn't taken any responsibility for the shooting incident, claiming that the South Korean tourist was shot and killed because she was trespassing in a restricted military area. The second issue is that of the May 24th sanctions imposed on North Korea since its sinking of the South Korean warship Cheonan in 2010. Seoul halted all trade with the North shortly after the attack, and the sanctions remain firmly in place. South Korea's unification minister recently said that there will be no lifting of the sanctions unless North Korea claims responsibility for the Chunan sinking that claimed the lives of 46 South Korean sailors. Seoul government officials continue to express an interest in resuming the tours, but unless the two delicate issues are resolved once and for all, the Kumgang Tourism Project is unlikely to resume anytime soon. And then, I did news. China's foreign ministry has declined to comment on reports that said 13 North Korean defectors were detained late last week in the country's southwestern city of Kunming. At Monday's press briefing, the foreign ministry spokesperson said Beijing was not aware of details of the incident reported by South Korean media. Quoting South Korean activists, reports said the group of would-be defectors had boarded a bus bound for an unidentified Southeast Asian country before being arrested last Friday. China's foreign ministry reiterated Beijing's stance of not recognizing North Korean defectors as asylum seekers, but rather as illegal border crossers. If you want the latest news from Korea and around the world, okay, to return to the negotiation. President Park Geun Hye plan given the current circumstances. On your way to work or at home, Defense Ministry. The legislature will convene April. Tune into Daybreak on Arirang TV. Prime Minister Shin Do Abe said Tuesday. Japan has begun the delicate process of removing fuel rods from one of the four nuclear reactors at the stricken Fukushima nuclear power plant. Plant operator TEPCO says it started removing the rods from a storage pond in reactor number four on Monday using robots and cranes. The removal is regarded as an important first step in the plant's decommissioning that's expected to take up to 40 years. It's expected to take at least one year to remove all 1,500 rods from reactor number four before workers can move on to other reactors. Experts warn that if the rods break or overheat during the removal process, highly radioactive gases could be released into the atmosphere. Mitsubishi Heavy Industries has appealed a recent ruling by a Korean court that ordered it to compensate Korean victims of forced labor during Japan's colonial rule. The Japanese firm claims all compensation matters were settled under a treaty signed in 1965 that normalized the two countries' diplomatic relations. Earlier this month, Gwangju District Court ruled in favor of five Korean victims and ordered the firm to pay about 140,000 U.S. dollars per person in damages. The victims, mostly in their 80s, will now have to wait for the appeals process and a final ruling by the Supreme Court of Korea. A local economic policy think tank forecasts Korea's annual inflation rate will hover just above 1 percent this year, and chances are the growth rate won't pick up next year either. Kim ji has more. The rate of increase in Korea's consumer prices is expected to surpass the 1 percent mark this year. The Seoul-based Korea Development Institute on Monday forecasts that consumer prices will surge by 1.1 percent this year, the lowest rate in 14 years. That's less than the inflation target set by Korea's central bank, which is between 2.5 and 3.5 percent. The state-run think tank attributed this to the country's economic recession, coupled with a decrease in aggregate demand and falling prices of agriculture, stock farm and fishery products. The institute added that 
that an economic recovery may move up consumer prices to 2 percent next year, but noted that this figure is still lower than the central bank's inflation target. The institute warned that the low rate of increase in consumer prices may affect the country's tax revenue in the near future, and said ways to lower the inflation target initially set by the Bank of Korea must be examined. Meanwhile, Korea's producer prices dropped for the 13th straight month in October as the prices of fresh farm produce fell. The Bank of Korea said Monday that the nation's producer prices slid 1.4 percent from the same period a year earlier. The drop was led by agricultural goods, which fell by nearly 7 percent. Oil prices also dropped, with Korea's benchmark Dubai crude falling 3.1 percent last month. Service prices, however, rose 0.4 percent. Kim ji Arirang News. On the trade front, Korea and China began their second phase of negotiations on a bilateral free trade agreement on Monday in Korea's western port city of Incheon. Based on the agreements reached in the first phase, the two countries will discuss the level of liberalization for specific commodities, classifying them into three categories, normal, sensitive and very sensitive. The Korean officials are also expected to ask their Chinese counterparts to amend competition-related regulations involving Korean companies in China. Outside where negotiations began, some 4,000 farmers gathered to protest the free trade pact and called on the government to come up with protective measures on prices of agricultural products. A U.S. appeals court has issued an order to reconsider imposing a permanent U.S. sales ban on some Samsung products. Monday's ruling by the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit adds new spice to the long-running global patent war between Samsung and Apple. The U.S. District Court for the Northern District of California refused the injunction filed by Apple last December. Apple claims Samsung infringed on its design and utility patents that are applied on its iPhones. The appeals court upheld the lower court's decision to order an injunction on design patents, but said the California court abused its discretion regarding the utility patents. French police are on the lookout for a lone gunman who opened fire, uh, fired several sh uh, shotgun rounds in the offices of a left-wing newspaper and outside a major bank before taking off on a hijacked motor. According to police on Monday, an assistant photographer of the Liberation Daily was shot and was seriously injured. French President François Hollande, speaking from Jerusalem, asked his interior minister to use all possible means to find the gunman. The gunman is also suspected of threatening people with a gun last Friday at a 24-hour news channel in Paris. Paris prosecutors have released two photos of the suspect and urged the public to call them if they have any information. And a good Tuesday morning to you all as we kick things off in the KBO. Now, after Che Jun Suk, the very last free agent available on the market, signed a four year deal worth 3.5 billion won or roughly 3.3 million US dollars with the Lotte Giants, the FA market officially closed. And let's just say there was a lot of money spent this season. Of course, with everyone expecting this to be one of the biggest FA seasons to date, there was a total of 52.3 billion won spent on the free agents or roughly 49.5 million U.S. dollars. But most of that money was spent on the top four FAs on the market in Kang Min-ho, Lee Yong-gyu, Chung Gunu, and Chang won sam with a total of 27.2 billion won, or roughly 25.74 million U.S. dollars. Of course, this year's FA market proving that KBO is slowly becoming a bigger market league. 
And staying in baseball, but over to the 2013 Asia Series, where the Samsung Lions went up against the Australian champions Canberra Calvary. Peyong Su taking the mound for the Samsung Lions. Struggles early on, giving up three runs and three innings of work as Samsung trailed early on. But the Samsung Lions offense come alive late as they rally back to tie this game 5 to 5 before heading into their second straight extra inning game. And unfortunately for the Samsung Lions, the bullpen collapses in the 10th inning as they give up four runs, losing this game 9 to 5 in extra innings as they fail to advance to the finals. And moving on to football, where the Tegok Warriors are set to face off against Russia later tonight in Dubai. After Korea beat Switzerland 2 1 last Friday, thanks to Lee Chung Yong's last minute goal, they'll now face off against the 19th ranked Russia. While Korea boasts speed and technique, the Russians have both the speed and the physical strength. But despite all this, the Korean national football team hopes the European stars will continue to shine going into this match later tonight. And speaking of European stars, Son Heung-min, who's having an amazing season over in the Bundesliga, continues to receive the spotlight as one of the best young talents in the world. Now, according to WhoScored.com, Son Heung-min is ranked fifth among some of the best young talents playing in Europe. The 21-year-old has four goals and two assists in nine matches with Bayer Leverkusen and has been named in the top five list along with Neymar of Barcelona, Ricardo Rodriguez of Wolfsburg, Luca Anti of Susaloa, and... Paul Pogba of Juventus. Now finishing things off with some shocking news in Shidham. Korean sports continues to get tainted with yet another match-fixing allegations. Now two Shidham athletes are under investigation over allegedly fixing a match back in January of 2012 when a 27-year-old with surname An paid around 10 to 20 million won to 37-year-old with surname Chang. Reports say that the seven-time champion Chang agreed to lose to An, who has never won a title. According to the coaches, they never knew about the deal as the prosecutors continue to investigate whether others were involved. And with that said, that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs. Good Tuesday morning to you. I'm Lee Ji-hyun with your latest weather updates. Well, did you get to have a glimpse of the first snow yesterday? It looked like it was snowing heavily for about two hours, but it tapered off shortly and completely let up here in the capital yesterday afternoon. But the rest of the country continued to receive on and off sleet and snow even overnight. So morning commuters stay safe on the roads because there could be ice roads this morning. Now, this weather is more more typical of what we would expect in uh, December rather than in mid-November. So be sure to bundle up tight and wear mufflers to raise your body temperatures. Now sky-wise, we will wake up to mostly to pearly cloudy skies. Uh, then mostly sunny skies will take over and the very cold front is expected to linger today and frost will be widespread. And of course, gusty winds will keep sensory temperatures colder than extra digits. Now tomorrow, doesn't seem so different from today's weather outlook. Our temperatures staying unseasonably chilly with highs struggling to reach 10 degrees Celsius under lots of sunshine. So with that in mind, here are the readings for today. Uh, so we'll make it up to 4 degrees Celsius, which is 39 degrees in Fahrenheit, while Gwangju sees a high of 7 and Daegu and Busan will get up to 9 respectively. Now let's see how other regions are looking. It looks like Jeju will get up to 11 this afternoon. Daejeon and Dokdo will top out at 6 and 4, uh, but Mount Kungang will be a cold minus 4. Now that's Korea for you, and here's the global forecast for viewers around the world. That's all for me at this hour. Enjoy your morning commute and hope you have a wonderful day.
And that does it for this Tuesday edition of Daybreak. Thank you for being with us.